Greetings, Learn to Love listeners. There's still time to register for the Heart Center's upcoming eight-week compassion cultivation training starting April 19th. This incredible course combines traditional contemplative practices with contemporary psychology and scientific research to help you lead a more compassionate life. Classes meet for two hours once a week online, which means you can join us no matter where you are in the world, and you will also receive numerous resources and daily meditations to practice on your own. We hope you can join us starting April 19th and finishing on June 14th from 4 to 6 p.m. Pacific Time. That's 7 to 9 p.m. Eastern Time. And you can join us no matter where you are in the world. To sign up, just go to theheartcenter.com and click on the link for the live online compassion cultivation training. Thanks so much for listening. We hope you enjoy the show. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Learn to Love podcast, your guide to everything love, sex, intimacy, and relationships. Each week, your host, Zach Beach, interviews new experts on love, including couples therapists, relationship coaches, sex educators, and best-selling authors. Learn the best tips and cutting-edge wisdom to better love yourself, others, and the world. Thanks so much for joining us. We hope you enjoy the show. Welcome to the Learn to Love podcast, everyone. I am your host, Zach Beach, and I'm here with the incredible love coach and writer, Judith Costa. Hello, Judith, and welcome to the show. Hi, Zach. I'm so happy to be here with you. Thank you for inviting me. I'm happy you're here too. And today we are going to be talking about falling in love with yourself. And for those that don't know, Judith Costa is an unconditional love coach, seminar leader, writer, and speaker with a master's degree in analytical psychology and psychotherapy and a master's in business administration. She is a certified consultant and teacher of the Akashic Records, a Reiki master, past life regression therapist, and a certified happiness trainer. She specializes in helping her clients have a better relationship with themselves, which transforms their lives, allowing them to create abundance, well-being, better relationships, and to find more happiness in their life. Judith offers trainings, retreats, and talks for groups and companies, and these programs include Fall in Love with Yourself, Fall in Love with Your Body, Loving Your Way to Happiness, the Workplace Well-Being Program, and how to find your soulmate. How are you today, Judith? I'm very good. <laughs> so thanks so much for coming on. I'm so very excited to speak with you today. You have such an amazing and incredible long list of qualifications and certifications. I'm just super impressed and in awe at the work that you do. And one of the things that particularly piqued my interest was your emphasis on being an unconditional love coach, not just a regular <laughs> conditional love coach, but an unconditional one. So first of all, I'm just curious how that came about. Well, my title is not love coach because then people think that I work with couples uh, fixing relationships and it's not what I do. And trying to talk about love, we all have this idea that that we learn since the beginning of our lives that love is I share my love with you and you share your love with me. And then we call this a relationship. And when this ends, I stop loving you and then you get mad at me and stop loving me and all of those <laughs> things. Then that's not love. Love is a, it's a state of being. It's a choice that you make. You can, you can love someone in spite of who the person is because it's your choice. It's your decision. And we tend to try to find love out there. Like I'm going to feel complete when someone really loves me because this will give me the validation, no? the sense of appreciation that I cannot find within myself. Then talking about all of this with someone that it's a good copywriter say, why you don't call yourself a conditional love coach? Because the beginning of my career started helping people how to find their soulmates and soulmates share a bond of unconditional love. They are eternal partners and and, and what they really want to do is to help each other to grow, even though 
relationships between soulmates are not perfect and we all as humans made mistakes, then that's more or less the explanation that what I really want to help people understand is that love is real love when it doesn't have limits, when it's free, when it's without boundaries, with its love, no matter what. And, uh, and again, this maybe is the PhD of love, but it's what we have to aim to and let go of the idea that love equals relationships because love is always available. Love doesn't fail you. It's a relationship that may not work between two individuals, but the love that you have shared will always be there. Wow, that's such a beautiful and incredible sentiment that we are taught in our society love is something out there that we need to find in another person. But you say love is a state of being. It's always available. We can always choose to find it and rest in it. And tell us more about how we do that and what are some of the greatest obstacles? Because I think people are kind of stuck in that other paradigm that love is something they need to receive from another person in order to feel it. So what are some ways that we can shift our consciousness and our understanding to resting, being, and feeling the love that, as you say, is always available? Let me start by sharing with you a little bit of my story. I think that people can can relate to that. The reason why I teach this idea of love and, and, and the, the core of my, my business and my interest is in self-love nowadays is because I didn't have any idea about what loving yourself means. And I think that that relationship works when two individuals that are together that already love themselves decide to share the love that they have for each other, then if I am with you and my tank of self-love is empty, then it's very difficult that I can give you anything. Then I'm going to be asking you to complete me, to make me happy. And I'm going to try to be sure that you continue giving me love and that you don't go away and that you demonstrate me that you really, really love me and all of these things. Then I, I tend to really lose myself in relationships and abandon myself. And I didn't have any other option than to start understanding what love is about. And to really took me into a quest for self-discovery. And I didn't know that the problem was that I didn't love myself at all because we all suffer through our lives of different problems. My parents got divorced when I was four. Then my mother remarried again. And even though I had a wonderful relationship with my stepfather, but it was not a like a peaceful, nice childhood. And, and then you start establishing relationships and, and you also learn from what you see in TV and, and uh, in movies and you talk about with your friends and what happens in your relationships. And all of these things gives you an idea about what love is about. And if you don't revisit all these places, then you continue with the same idea because as you said, it's what society proclaims, then what you can do to arrive to the point where you understand that love is not like you and me is to start looking at the, the qualities, for example, of loving yourself, things that, that, that you can do right now. For example, stop criticizing yourself like crazy. We all have this inner critic within ourselves. Usually it doesn't say a lot of nice things. We are so hard on ourselves and not kind. We tell ourselves things that we will never tell someone else. And if love is unconditional, it's because it has to start with yourself. The more you accept yourself, the easier it is to accept others. The same happens if we take another area of self-love, like forgiveness, for example. Love is unconditional because no matter what you do, there is a place where I can forgive myself and you. Not because you haven't done anything wrong, not because I'm saying, yeah, it's okay that you do this. I'm not going to change the facts. That's past. I'm not going to be able to change what happened between us. But I can decide not to get stuck in that moment in time, in that experience. And forgive the other person and forgive me. That's, that's, that's so powerful. That allows us to live in a different world of love. When I'm not always looking at the other person, other people, like siblings, family, co-workers, as they are the source of my problems, I take responsibility for the way I live and love. And I look on how can I take care of love? Again, the more I take care of myself, the easier it is to understand that people need to rest. Maybe if I'm a leader, I'm not going to ask like you work 
long hours, like forever, expecting that you have the same performance. If if I'm a mom, then I'm going to be an example for my kids in order to life is is pleasure too. It's not only about hard work and, and just doing the right things all the time, maybe not taking things so seriously. Then it becomes a quest for love, but not outside, inside, where I'm looking for being more confident, but not because I have everything figured out. It's because I have a higher connection with my higher self or with uh, the powerful force that controls the universe. I'm going to be finding my voice and expressing my needs and desires. And then I give room for others to do the same. And the more I shine, the more I love, the more I bring this into the world. It's my energy that I have that I can give to you without being depleted. I love that. I love that. (laughs) Um, (laughs) That's so fantastic and it's so refreshing to hear. And I just want to repeat something you said towards the beginning of your reply along the lines of, A relationship works when two individuals that already love themselves decide to share the love that they have with the other person. And so too, I'm in this self-compassion course right now, and it goes a lot into the scientific research, and it all validates everything that we're talking about. Self-compassionate people are not more selfish or indulgent. They care more for others. Those that accept themselves are more accepting of others. And it's really just promising and inspiring to hear this from you. And you started mentioning your life path. And I wouldn't mind hearing more about it because you mentioned how you didn't know quite what self-love was. You were losing yourself in relationships. Since then, you have now taken an abundance of courses to help you perhaps more live with love and to be more happy. And I'm curious what that looked like. Was it a transition from maybe like clinical depression and drinking every weekend to meditating on top of a mountain? Like what <laughs> What was the process for you of discovering, you know, self-love? Like what were some things that you did? I love to learn. Then, then yes, in order to find answers, I had to put certain things together. And I think I will never stop uh, learning. And, and I invite, you, you cannot love something or someone that you don't know, then better you you spend some time with you alone. And I did that. But as you mentioned, yeah, it was, I didn't have a choice. I had the perfect life from outside, like a good husband, the house, the financial means, uh, a job that doesn't have anything to do with all of this and that everybody think it was great, but I didn't like, but I was feeling miserable. Then when you don't make choices, when you don't change, there is a moment where life will put you in that spot. Because you are going to have problems. In my case, it was health problems with the thyroid. It was depression. And, and again, I didn't know how to do that because I remember sitting with my father and, and he telling me, you have to change your thoughts. And he was so serious and so like, what you don't get about that? But I wasn't able to do that. And I'm a very, very romantic person by nature. I love love. I I love to fall in love. I, I I believe that love, true love exists. That's the reason when I discover the concept of soulmates, because I read a book of Brian Wise, Only Love is Real, I thought, wow, that's that's amazing. It did it really resonated with me. And I went into this quest of, of demonstrating myself that my husband at that moment was my soulmate. And what a surprise that I opened a Pandora box. Because so intense was my desire that I met one of my soulmates, this person showed up through my dreams. That was the reason why I studied this two-year master in psychology and psychotherapy based on the teachings of Carl Gustav Jung to understand what was happening in my dreams. But then there were synchronicities. And I met this, this person that was one of my, uh, my first boyfriend. So 15 years after, in the middle of a big city like Barcelona, the night that I had a dream, then it was kind of the the universe was guiding me, then I started receiving messages about the love that I, that I felt in dreams. Then when your nights are better than your days, you have a problem because if you can feel such an amount of love that exists, that moves you, that when you wake up, you take it with you and you don't have this in your relationship and it's what you want, but takes two to, to be together and to really build that, then There was a moment where, and I'm going to make it short, very short, where I realized that I wasn't in the right relationship for me, even though I love this person and I will 
always loved my ex-husband. And I met him when I was 18 and we were 17 years together eight as a boyfriend and then we got married. Then it was all my life. Then living that relationship was a big deal for me. And even though I saw perfectly and I think I'm smart now, maybe a little bit wiser than I was before, I hope that I knew at that moment that I couldn't put my happiness in his pocket and I had to do my own work in order to really start loving myself. But it was a sort of realizations, meeting the right teachers. I started studying astrology as a tool for self-discovery again. I went into the world of dreams. I, I really, without going through therapy, like just my own self-coaching, I start putting things together that give me answers. I tried to read every book on self-help that was translated into Spanish at the moment. <laughs> my English was not so, so good. and. Uh, and it was a process of transformation. I don't think there was a key point, even though the story of the soulmate is bigger and and and, and better. But uh, but that was that was what really transformed my life. My no choice of you cannot continue living like that. Your health is in risk. You are totally unhappy. And what can you do? So sounds like a really challenging situation. From the outside, I had a wonderful life. But on the inside, as you mentioned, you were miserable. And then you started on this continuous process of discovery and learning about yourself. And where are you now, would you say? Oh, I think I have changed a lot. I'm very analytical also, and I, I tend to uh, attract clients that are very analytical. And it's, it's important to understand that we can train the mind, that your mind has to be your best ally, not your enemy. Then learning meditation, learning uh, a mindful way of living, understanding all of these things that you have to build the appreciation. It doesn't matter that nobody told you when you were a kid or you were growing up that you were valuable, that, that you are going to make it. And most of my clients have difficult, very difficult, I mean, not even near to what I share, super complicated beginning of their lives and childhood and, and problems of, of abuse or parents that don't take care of them. And we can overcome those kinds of things. It's about deciding not to live in the past and being trained into living in the present moment. That is where life is happening. Then I think I did that. I learned how to let go, how to release. Very important tool for everyone. I mean, that's the previous to forgive or equals to, to forgiving. And uh, when I thought that even I was teaching all of these things that I learned, <laughs> I was diagnosed with thyroid cancer and I decided not to do the surgery. I, I took one year, almost and a half to try to heal naturally. And then I put in practice all the self-love that I was uh, explaining to others to the really total in practice. I mean, I devote the life to really enjoy it. I did things that I abandoned, like dreams that I had. So silly things like learning to prepare candles. I took myself to the places where I wanted without thinking about my bank account. Uh, I changed my diet. I decided to go out of the house no matter what, because working at home is very easy. Like, yeah, I'll do it later, later, later. And three days uh, pass and you are still in your house. And uh, then connecting with nature becomes a something very important and doing yoga. I wasn't very active. Then from, again, from the point where we were talking until now, I think that there has been a lot of uh, changes in my life. But I always tell people when I start this workshop, fall in love with yourself, that loving yourself is a process. And I invite the participants to choose the three most difficult, most difficult aspects that they have. Because if you try to do everything at the same time, it's really overwhelming. Then you stop. So I have to ask, how what happened with the cancer? Uh, that I end up doing the surgery. Okay. Uh, and but I'm after a year of well. living life. Yeah, I was reducing. It was very small. And it's a kind of cancer, even though the word sounds terrible, but it's not aggressive. Then I had yeah. the opportunity. I mean, I was monitoring it every two, three months. Uh, I was under the care of an oncologist. I mean, it's not that I was taking herbs and nothing happened. No, I was really doing everything I could. But again. Now I know things that I didn't know by then. Then now I understand that 
to feel healed, you have to feel whole and complete. It's not about fighting a cancer. It's about being in this state of bliss where the cancer doesn't have a space in your life anymore. And I was under a lot of emotional stress because for second time in my life, the relationship where I was, was not good. Then I had the choice between, should I heal first the cancer or do something about the relationship? Or then, then it really is all about also taking care of our emotional state because it's what it's behind every imbalance. I don't like to use the word illness. You're not an illness. It's just an imbalance. The body tends to return to normal state and homeostasis. It's, it's us that are on the way <laughs> somewhere. I love that. To feel healed, you have to feel whole. That's beautiful. And I want to get really big here because I feel like you're a wonderful person to ask because you mentioned how we can train the mind to be more happy. We can use meditation to cultivate love within ourselves. We can practice a more mindful way of living, of being in the present moment. You mentioned the importance of connecting with nature, doing things in our body like yoga, and also this idea of loving yourself as a process. So I'm wondering how these things just integrate into living a meaningful life or almost what you feel like the meaning of life is as part of this strange, you know, and wonderful human experience. You know, is it love? Is it happiness? Is it spiritual awakening? Is it something else? I know that you'd even do some, you know, past life stuff. Like, why would you say we have been reincarnated into these bodies? Well, the only reason why we are here is to learn how to love and how to be loved. <laughs> and we do this through wonderful relationships that we establish. And we, I believe also that we have soul agreements. That's the interesting part about uh, learning more about your past lives, because we agree with certain people to have experiences previously, like it's a decision that we take previously to reincarnate. Even uh, it's in our soul plan, no? But uh, who is going to help me to build my the love for myself? The two important relationships where I had, it's curious, but both have the same sign and the same ascendant. And uh, they are self-centered. Leos are, they see their world. It's not a criticism. It's just the way they are wired, usually. Uh, how is their nature? And there are people that are not going to be there empowering you they know very well how to do it, then sometimes the relationship that you feel like is the worst for you <laughs> is the one that it's providing you exactly the material you need to learn. And when, when you are in that relationship, maybe you don't see it, but you have to survive, you have to thrive, and you have to become the better version of yourself. And, and again, the other person might be there it seems torturing you or not doing what you feel it's the right thing to do. And it's for your soul's growth. It's very funny when um, I do consultations on the Akashic Records. We can explain the listeners uh, what it's more in depth. But it's like the book of your soul where everything about you is, is recorded. And I'm sharing this with you because when people ask about the purpose of, of their lives, many of them receive you are here to be happy. And they say, that's it? Really? <laughs> so simple. It's like with a face of so surprise, like, wow, that's it? Yes, it is. Then we tend to look to other places where it's really simple. <laughs> it's, it's just love and learn how to love and you will become happier and you will make the world a better place, sharing your happiness and your love with others. Wow. And no, I'm just imagining a listener just driving down the street, like, what should I do with my life? And here's your answer. <laughs> we are here to learn how to love and how to be loved. Full stop. That's it. The rest is for decoration. I'm sorry to interrupt you. <laughs> the, the rest, rest is, is just decoration. decoration. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm writing that down. The rest is for decoration. That's beautiful. And I also loved how you said that sometimes the relationship that feels the worst is providing the material that you need to learn. And you also mentioned earlier that loving yourself is a process. And I would love to hear more about what that process looks like. And before we get into that, I want to ask the why, because you almost mentioned before just how much self-love transformed your own life. And I know you yourself like write and talk about this idea 
that loving ourselves will transform every area of our life. So before I get into, well, how might I love myself better? How might we convince somebody that it's worth it doing this task of better loving ourselves? Because love is the highest vibration that exists. And the reason why it transforms your life is because in the moment you love yourself no matter what, you start making different choices. Like love is not a concept. It's a verb. It has to be demonstrated into action. Then you have to start choosing differently the experiences and the relationships and, and the acts, the daily acts, uh, change. Then it will mean that you will have a different organization. It will be that you will able to attract abundance. Last Saturday I was teaching a, a workshop on how to manifest your desires. And I, I tell the, the participants, I mean, why do you think that me, that I'm focused on the world of love, I'm teaching this? It's because what gives you everything that you desire is this unconditional love. That's what brings you the rest. It's the foundation. But we tend to think that kind of I'll, I'll, I'll see when I receive love, then I, my tank will be full instead of knowing that you are the one that has to replenish that tank and that your actions matter. I don't know about, did I answer? <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. I think that's one of the biggest shifts, you know, that happen when we do begin almost any kind of spiritual practice or contemplative practice is we realize that what we seek can be cultivated inside of us, outside of any external conditions, that happiness is not to be found out there somewhere hiding under a rock, but it is something that we can literally offer ourselves. And imagine how important it is that you stop being a victim of the circumstances. It's like, okay, I had bad luck and then this is what happens with my life because I was not lucky in the family I was born or with the resources or no, there is something I can do about it. And that's to stop putting your happiness in someone else's pocket, as I said, no? I really felt depleted. I didn't know, maybe because of my sensitivity, maybe because of my story, it doesn't matter why, but I didn't know how to love myself. I was so hard on myself that I was becoming my worst enemy. Just trying to be perfect didn't allow me to be me. And loving yourself is just that. It's becoming your best friend. It's just being authentically you. And nobody teaches that in the school, unfortunately. I hope one day it will happen. But uh, when I was in front of all of these things that were happening to me, nobody come to me and tell me, oh, your problem is a problem of self-love. Like my clients don't come saying, yeah, I don't love myself enough. It's, we see the consequences of not loving, our, not loving ourselves. And, uh, and some of them are physical, others are emotional, others are in terms of fulfillment, purpose, happiness. That's such an important insight that people suffer from the consequences of self-love, but they don't attribute it to that lack. They might think it's something else. Oh, my boss is such a jerk or something, right? Yeah. Yeah. Let's blame others for all our problems. (laughs) But usually the clients that I have, they have figured out that they are the common piece, that no matter what is happening and it's a pattern that is repeating, they always have been there. And they start thinking there must be something around this that that I'm contributing. And that's the starting point to work with someone. The realization that no matter what others bring into your life, you always have a choice. It's up to you how you take it or how you engage or what you do with it. So I'd love to hear more about what that self-love looks like. So you mentioned that loving yourself is a process, that it is a process of becoming our best friend. And I'm thinking like, does this mean bubble baths and hot chocolate? Like, <laughs> Zach, <laughs> please don't do that. <laughs> don't? No, that's true. That's true. A lot of people think that self-love is self-care. And they think that just doing the manicure, going to a spa and taking a bubble bath, it's that self-love. But no. Self-care, it's, it's only a part and it's very important because, because again, if I knew in my past what I know now, I'm sure that my health would be totally different at that moment in time. And I'm grateful for the experience because it allows me to be having this conversation with you now from a totally different perspective. And that's the reason why I created the second workshop after the cancer, fall in love with your body, no? because self-care is very important. And we only think about physical, but what about your emotional life? Everything that you don't release is, is baggage that you carry. All the emotions that you repress, suppress, uh, ignore, don't listen to, 
keep coming and no matter what you want to do with them to keep them hiding, they will, they will be there because it's what they do. They give you a message. And if you don't want to get the message, they will keep appearing in, in your life in the most unexpected moments, usually when you don't want. And they will be triggered by others. Others will show you exactly where, where are your buttons and what, what happens. Then, then it's, it's, it's quite important when we think about self-love is that you are not a body. You are not your mind. You are not your thoughts. Please don't believe everything your mind tells you because it's not true. Oh, it might not be true. And uh, it's, a, it's a process, as, as, as we have been talking, of shifting from allowing these thoughts of, that usually contains criticism and judgment to be shift into a more loving, more kind and softer uh, ideas about yourself while you build a sense of appreciation also a gratefulness for what you have instead of seeing what's wrong with you or what you haven't achieved or what you don't have or where you fail. Start knowing that you are good enough as you are, that there is always room for improvement, but that your perfection doesn't come from doing everything right. It comes from your divine essence and the ability to start understanding what's happening within you gives you the opportunity to change whatever you want, but without being so mean with yourself and treating you in a bad way. You don't deserve that. Nobody, nobody can do that to you, but especially not you. You shouldn't. <laughs> so what I'm almost hearing from you is that while self-care can be an important part of self-love, what it really involves might be really necessary emotional work. I love how you mentioned that Everything that you don't release emotionally is baggage that we carry. And what I'm also hearing from you is a sort of rewiring of mental patternings from more negative, self-judgmental, critical thinking to more appreciation. And I'm also hearing a bit of self-realization because when you mentioned you're not your body, your mind, or your thoughts, my follow-up question was going to be, well, what are we then? But then you mentioned the divine essence inside all of us. <laughs> <laughs> so that it's like what I'm hearing yeah. <laughs> is almost like heart, mind, and spirit here. Yeah, exactly. You are all you are. You are here as a human, having this wonderful human experience that you have chosen. But you are also this divine essence connected. Then, when I talk about self confidence, for example, people think that they are going to be confident when they have everything figured out, when they don't have fear. And they can go th without fear. No, fear is a very normal uh, emotion that protects us. Then it's about taking the fear with you and going together. But how you build confidence is about trusting in the universe, trusting the universe, living in a world that you make you feel safe and protected because there is a force that will guide you. It's a little bit of a surrender, not Oh, I have clarity on how I have to proceed, then I feel so confident. That was what I was trying to do in my past. When you asked me what changed, then that changed. Because now if I can have this connection with the Akashic records, that the intermediate beings that gives you the information are divine uh, emissaries of the divine, pure and conditional love for you, then I teach people that it's not that I'm gifted and I can do that. Uh, you can be trained in a weekend on how to open your Akashic records that everything is transformed because you become more connected. You have like the possibility to know intuitively things and you receive guidance. You feel that you are not alone. That gives you the confidence. Then every aspect of self-love will bring something into the total. This is like, a, there is an author that equals the self-love to a tree and every area of self-love is like a branch. But the more you take care of one of the branches, the more the, the tree itself becomes stronger and in better health. Then it's the way I see it. That's the reason why I allow people to choose. I mean, tell me what is more difficult for you and we will start with that because just changing some things, like if you are very uh, self, I mean, judgmental, then let's uh, see what is the real relationship with you. Let's do journaling and let's uh, really know what are you telling people yourself during the day. We, let, let's have, let's see what other thoughts we, you can bring. Let's discover how you really treat yourself. A lot of people say, no, I have a wonderful relationship with yourself. 
then after one week of journaling or writing in the phone, everything I think about myself, they are pretty scared. Like, wow, I didn't know that. I was so <laughs> bad in, in terms of, I said, change the radio station. Go to a station that plays more love. Instead of being there, like just looking at is what is not working. I love that. And I love how you said that people think they will be confident when they have everything figured out. And I'm like, you can replace that word confident with a lot of things, right? People think <laughs> they will finally find peace, finally be happy yeah. when they have everything figured out. You know, it's like, can you be happy now? And like, no, I'm so stressed. I have so many things on my to-do list. And people often do deny themselves like peace and happiness in the moment because they don't have everything wrapped up and put together and they never will. Like we never will, right? We'll never have everything figured yeah. out, everything <laughs> crossed off the to-do list, no stressors, the clean house, like it never actually happens. So it is a matter of coping amongst the uncertainty, which you mentioned involves sort of just trusting in the natural order and harmony in the universe. Yeah, but we are used again, what society tells us is like, I will... I will believe when I'll see it. And it's the opposite. It's that... I'll see it when, when you... I believe it. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Thank you. <laughs> it's like we are waiting for proofs of some of the things that we have to start really believing. And then there is a, like a, a door that we didn't even know that existed that opens up for us. Then none of the of the people that were I was surrounded by when I had difficulties in my life, even not in my family, nobody believes these things, then it, it has been a path that sometimes you have to do alone. And it doesn't matter if the environment where you live supports it or not. You do this for you. Then you do it because you want and you feel inspired or you do it when you have a crisis. Um, but no matter what, there, there is going to be a moment where you will have to look inside. But through the eyes of love. The only power that will allow you to transform your life is really through love. Not control, not trying harder, not uh, getting more resources. I do love that switch, right? You'll see it when you believe it because I don't think people realize that we don't see the world as it is, right? We see the world as we are, right? What we see in the world is a reflection of our own mental habits and conditioning. You know, you could think the world is a dangerous place. You could think the world is a place to be trusted and surrendered to. And this will change, of course, your reality and how you go about through life. Yeah, it's exactly that. And where you place the energy is very important because, for example, gratitude has never been something that I have connected in the past. It's not until I arrived to the U.S. where it's a very, uh, very normal world. I don't think that that we use it the same way in, in Spanish. And uh, all of these elevated emotions, no, the joy, this inner peace, this gratitude, this love, takes you to a different place on their own. Then the more you focus on that, you may not feel it. When I, when I get up in the morning, I may not feel joyful, but I place my intention there. I go and I connect with a place of love. I think about my pet, uh, my catapolo or whatever moment where I felt really loved. And I take it into my heart. I, I am sure that I open my heart. I go around when I was, when I walk in the mornings, connecting with everything. It doesn't matter if it's a tree or it's a squirrel and, and, and looking with admiration at this miracle that it's life, life around us. And how easy it is to forget that everything exists. And just be in the busyness of the day. I'm not asking you to devote one hour. I'm just the, the two minutes that you are waiting the elevator, just connect with this idea. Oh, wow. And thank you because I'm thankful because I'm alive and this is my life. Or send a smile. Love comes back when you share it. A smile to someone in the elevator instead of being on your phone. Say a nice word, a compliment. Like practice love. Share it with others. It's totally free. <laughs> It's true. You know, love is all about that connection. And each moment we can pause and connect to whatever it is that we're doing or whatever, it, whoever it is that we are with. Or if we're out in the nature, we can connect with, of course, the lovely plants and animals that are around us. And I loved your earlier emphasis on how important, important unconditional love is over the more reciprocal tit for tat that we find in relationships. And I also love that today's topic is not just how to love yourself, but falling in love with ourselves. 
And I'm wondering if you could tell us more about that distinction or more about what it means to literally fall in love with ourselves. Because I think usually people are caught up in the narrative that falling in love with another person is the ultimate goal or ultimate, you know, achievement in life. Yeah, no, thank you for the question. Uh, I don't know if from a marketing standpoint, people <laughs> get it. <laughs> but uh, being in love, falling in love is one of the most wonderful things that you can experience in your life. And it's a little bit like provocative to tell people that you can have the same feeling for yourself. But again, it's not something that happened instantaneously. Like we feel like when I met you and there is an instant connection, no, or I recognize my soulmate and then, wow, this is, this is happening. No, I mean, we haven't been together or introduced to each other, but my, my heart recognizes your heart. No, it's about me and me. What is happening inside of me that I can really build this sense of acceptance, appreciation, self-respect, understanding, knowing my worth, my value, my uniqueness, that by putting attention to all of these things, I really can fall in love with myself instead of what I was saying before, not this perspective that I have to become better. I have to do it the other way. I'm not, I'm not a good mom. I'm not a good co-worker. I'm not. And this idea of that improve your life goes through judging and placing attention to the mistakes. Mistakes that doesn't exist. They are just decisions that you make at that moment in time with what you had, like with the knowledge, with the opportunity that you had at the moment, then how hard we are on ourselves. And it really doesn't make sense because again, there is a powerful energy that allows you to transform yourself and that's love. But looking for it inside seems to be a like, a, wow, what are you, what are you saying to this? The love it's inside me. No, I thought that someone has to awake it. Yeah. And, and this happens. There are many ways, many different loves, like, and you can love your pet, you can love your children, you can love your parents and, and you have love for all of them. Love is abundant. You don't have to say, oh, if I love my pet, then I'm going to stop loving my partner, like minus 5% because I have limited availability of love. No. The more you love, the more you can you can have the experience, but it also comes back to you. I mean, there is there is yeah, in a certain way, an exchange if you want, but it's the love without the expectations, the love that I'm talking about. The no conditions is like I'm not loving because I get something out of you. I'm not loving because we have a contract that says we are married. I want to love you, and I choose to do that, including forgiving yourself, including being nice and kind when you are not, and, and many other things. And this is not about being a, a good person. It's about understanding what love is at its core and, and growing in love or with someone else sharing this path in a way that we become the best version of ourselves or we just become who we really are. Again, our divine essence, no? Wow, that's so inspiring. I do believe in that love is infinite, that the more love we give, the more that we have. And I've also heard this as described as the addit additive model of love, right? That any love strengthens all love. The more love we give others, the more love we can feel ourselves. So thank you so much for reminding us <laughs> the love that we have and the love that we can share for others. And as our time is wind, winding down, before I get to my final question, I just want to ask you about that cliche that we're often told that you can't love somebody else until you love yourself or you have to love yourself before you love somebody else. And what's your take on this idea? No, that, uh, that, that's not true. You, you don't have to be perfect to <laughs> love someone else, especially not perfect in terms of self-love. But I think that that if you, if you planted the seed of the understanding that I don't need you or you are not obligated to be with me, that love is something that we can build together, that will create a, an easier relationship. Usually when people have a sense of self-love, there is less drama in relationships, less power struggles, uh, less neediness. I'm not with you because I'm alone. A lot of people are in relationships where they, they don't want to be like me, I'm very slow in living relationships where I know that I shouldn't be, but uh, I'm Taurus, I'm slow. Uh, but we become afraid, like, what is going to happen to me? I'm going to be alone. Then we stay there. And then the more you know your value, the less you are going to remain in a place you know is not good for you. 
And no, you don't have to be perfect in terms of self-love, but I think that you will love differently. That's the selling point right there. You don't have to love yourself to be in a happy relationship, but there will be less drama. <laughs> <laughs> Smooth <laughs> relationship. <laughs> so, it'll help. It'll help. Well, it will, it will help much more because how, how big is the amount of suffering that we experience in relationships? Not only in romantic relationships. I mean, we are all traumatized for things that happen to us. And the minimum thing that someone else does, oh, it's my fault, doesn't love me. What happened? I'm not valuable. I'm not good enough. Because we take things so personally that the other, the other person maybe doesn't know how to act better, but it's a demonstration how the other person is. And we take it like I'm throwing away all my self-love because the other person have acted in a certain way. Then... Loving yourself will allow you to remain in, the, in this state of, of centeredness no? or more balance where you are able to receive input from outside and, and process kind of if you receive uh, some words of not appreciation that the opposite, someone criticizes you or tells you something that uh, you have done, but at the same time to, to look at it through the eyes of love and say, okay, let me make a distinction between what is mine and what is yours. I send back to you what you need to take care of. That's your responsibility. And I take care of my responsibility. But the word responsibility feels a little bit like too much for people, but it means that you have the ability to respond differently to life. And again, uh, we're talking about life, not only love. Like love is the way we, we go through all of this. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Judith Costa. This time has just flown by. I don't know how it happened, but we got to wind down. And I feel like you've already answered it in many different ways. But I have to ask the same question I ask all of my guests to close out the show, which is, what do you wish everyone knew about love? I mentioned it before, but I'm going to repeat it because I think it's very important. I explain a little bit more. No, Love... It's always there for you. Love is always available. It never fails you. It never abandons you. It's, it's right with you, where you are. And sometimes we don't see it and we don't know how to connect with it. But it's like plugging a, like a lamp. You, you have this, this beautiful light. And in the moment you decide just to plug, then you, you, you shine. This love energy is, uh, is who you are, is, is that light then never get angry or think that because a relationship has not worked or because there are not people around you that really love you or understand you or appreciate or gets you, that you don't have the right to receive love or that you don't deserve it. No, you deserve all the love of the world. It's all for you and it's there. You deserve all the love of the world. <sighs> thank you, Judith Costa. You have warmed my heart during this interview. So thank you so much for coming on. And for our listeners who have been really inspired by your words today, how can they find you? It has been a pleasure. And it's so easy to talk with you everywhere in social media. And uh, most important in my website, it contains all the information about private sessions, workshops, classes, and everything I do. And there is a contact form uh, there where they will find my telephone number, my email, and they can be in touch, then I will be happy to to help anyone that wants to know a little bit more about love and put it in practice that, again, it requires action. It sure does. So the action could be to go to judithmcosta.com. That will also be in the show notes. So thank you so much so much, Judith, for coming on to the show. And thank you listeners for listening to the show. We hope you remember all the very valuable lessons for today. And people that have listened to the show know that at the end, I love to summarize some of the speakers or some of the guests' key points. And there's just too many to summarize. So I just have to remind our listeners of this. We are on this planet to learn how to love and how to be loved. The rest is decoration. <laughs> Thank I you, just Zach. Love that, so. Lots of love to everyone. <laughs> so if you want to learn more about me, you can head to ZachBeach.com and learn more about the show at TheHeartCenter.com. Thanks again, Judith. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Thanks again for listening to the Learn to Love podcast. To learn more about the show and your host, 
head over to ZachBeach.com or TheHeartCenter.com. You can also follow Zach on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. 